Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Gail Isles and I'll be talking to you today about how astronauts are going to survive the journey into space for long-term missions on the Moon and Mars and what challenges space radiation brings to those missions. The Artemis missions will send the first woman and the next man back to the surface of the Moon as early as 2024. We have a lot of work to do to prepare technology, our crew and our spacecraft if we're going to make that a reality within the next few years. We're looking at setting up permanent bases on the Moon and we're also looking at setting up a permanent crewed habitat on the Moon. We're going to need new materials, we're going to need new technologies and we're going to need robust crew who can cope and survive in this harsh environment for longer than we've survived before. The body undergoes a lot of changes very quickly. You know, we lose muscle mass, we lose bone density. So what if people are living on the moon, living on, the Mar on Mars for, for a number of years? They may go through some changes that can't be reversed. Would it be possible for humans to adapt and uh, to provide their own protection in space? Who knows? W what an exciting thought. Up until now, most of the astronauts who have gone into space have gone into what's called low Earth orbit. All of the spacecraft and all of the people in this low Earth orbit have been protected by the Earth's magnetic field that stretches an incredibly long way away from the surface of the Earth. And what that does is it generates a shield. And the shield protects us from some very nasty stuff that's coming out of our sun. If we're going to travel to the moon, how is this magnetic field going to protect us? Well, if we're behind the Earth, we're going to certainly be protected in what's called a magneto tail. The problem comes, of course, when that moon moves around in its orbit and comes out here. When it's close to the sun, there's no more protection. When it comes to a solar flare, the actual particles that are being emitted are protons, electrons, and some high element ions. The coronal mass ejections are also emitting protons and electrons. The galactic cosmic radiation has protons, nucleons, electrons, and it also has a bit of antimatter. As if all that wasn't bad enough, we then have an additional problem. The additional problem is that when the solar flares, the coronal mass ejections, and the galactic cosmic rays impact other materials, they generate secondary radiation. So this brings into the soup of particles neutrons and gamma rays. So when it comes to designing our spacecraft, we have to allow for all of these things and we have to protect against all of these particles. Here I'm showing a picture of the Columbus Laboratory. It's one of the modules on the International Space Station and this diagram shows how the structure is split through a kind of sandwich arrangement of materials. So the bumper shield that is facing space is actually a very thin piece of aluminium. What follows next is an air gap. Next, there come some materials, Kevlar, epoxy, Nextel, and they're used inside the spacecraft walls to provide not just radiation shielding, but also to act as a kind of net in case any meteors or debris actually penetrates the first outer hull, they'll be caught in this fabric net. Next comes another air gap. Then there's a third layer of aluminium, and from then onwards, you're inside the spacecraft, and that's where the people live. So you can see, at the moment, the technology is fairly simple. One of the proposed solutions for a habitat on the moon is to actually use the, the, the material on the surface of the moon itself, and igloo-style build blocks out of what's called the lunar regolith, and use those to build habitats. Another solution is to abandon that altogether and just go and live underground, like we did in our first days on, on the Earth. We, we, we started out living in caves because they provided the natural protection. We certainly need to look far more to uh, recycling and, and uh, uh, you know, a circular use of materials once we're out there 
because there's a lot of great resources. We really don't want to be launching everything from Earth every time. So in terms of the people inside the spacecraft, they are receiving what's called a radiation dose. We need to monitor how high that dose gets when those astronauts are working in space. The astronauts on board the International Space Station, although they're very close to the surface of the Earth in the grand scheme of things, they are still getting a higher dose than we would get down here on Earth. And if we look forward to the days when we'll be traveling to Mars, the doses become very high. The human research program of NASA say that this risk is currently unacceptable. So we are not going to be sending people to Mars anytime soon. So I've mentioned passive shields, but one area of research is called active shielding. This is where we take the principle of the Earth's magnetic field and try to recreate it in a device that could be used to protect spacecraft. The only way we can create a strong enough magnetic field in a small area is with superconducting magnets. These superconducting magnets are proposed to surround the spacecraft and generate this huge magnetic field, which will deflect the particles as they come in. The problems are that these coils, in order to generate a magnetic field strong enough, have to be massive. This means it is far too large to be launched, it's far too heavy to be launched cost-effectively, and once it's up there, it needs to be maintained. At RMIT University, within the space physics group, our solution takes the passive shielding, it combines it with an electromagnetic shield, and then through a unique and novel configuration of those elements, provides the shielding that's necessary. So what our solution does is it takes the coils away as from the, the, the walls in that sense and puts them elsewhere so that the deflection occurs outside the spacecraft and generates a protected void. It's exactly where it needs to be, in the center of the spacecraft. So the people know that as soon as those shields are turned on, they're being protected and they're also not being damaged. There's an additional problem for the crew who are going to set foot on the surface of the moon, a problem I haven't yet told you about, as if all the others weren't problem enough. The people who are going to walk on the moon are walking on a surface which itself is creating yet more radiation. Charged particles are emitted, impact the surface of the moon, which has no atmosphere like our Earth does, and it has no magnetic field like our Earth does, those protons are traveling at such high speeds that they're actually creating neutron radiation off the surface. So when it comes to people traveling into space, we have to consider many, many factors. There is a lot of talk about going further than the moon and putting people on the surface of Mars. Our astronauts simply are not going to be able to survive the radiation environment unless we come up with new solutions to shield them and protect them from all those myriad effects that are found in space. So it is most certainly in our interest to send probes and rovers and other spacecraft to these hostile environments first. And we'll take that data and we'll take that knowledge and with it form the best solutions that we can to protect our astronauts and our crew in the future. There's always somebody who says, oh, shouldn't we solve the problems on Earth first? That statement implies that we can only have one or the other. We have this incredible situation right now where we can. We can explore space. So let's do it, let's explore. There are so many technological solutions that we have on Earth and we utilize daily for the betterment of society that save lives for society because we dared to dream, because we dared to explore. We can do both. <laughs>